Good evening, folks. This is a mad painter, a.k.a. Thomas Becker, and this is Open Canvas at Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. Our guest tonight is an author and researcher into three major fields, alternative agriculture, new age physics, and metaphysics. Original team member of Black Ops Research, he worked 10 years with the Navy in the field of parapsychology and parapsychics. He began his career in magic when he could not find answers to his questions in physics. In 1972, he opened up Ballantyne Occult Books and Supply. He is a Swiss Mason and has been inducted into numerous pagan cults. I've talked to this man a couple of times on roundtables, but I never got to talk to him on a one-to-one -one basis. And it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Richard Allen Miller to the show. How are you doing this evening? Oh, I'm good. Thank you. I read part of your book. Now, I ain't going to admit to reading the whole thing. It's quite an extensive book. The book I'm talking about now is Power Tools for the 21st Century. And it's a little above my head. <laughs> Most of it is. Well, I, I didn't mean to make it that way. What it is, basically, the eight protocols that I developed for Navy SEALs back 30 years ago to make us into supermen. And these were toys enhancements. You know, how to wire yourself up with certain kinds of drugs and uh, uh, brain drivers and, you know, gizmos, biofeedback. And how to use them to become a superman. And what I'm doing now is offering these to the public 30 years later like I would nuclear energy for medicine. It's like, here's something. These tools work. These are things that you can use to take personal responsibility for your own evolution. 30 years later, you know, the course they're down the road now, military is using a lot more things. I'm writing about some of that today on my third book, which will sequel this, then called The Non-Local Mind in a Holographic Universe, How to Change the Movie. The idea that we're all currently enjoying this movie, what do we call it, horror on Elm Street, there you go, and uh, it's the way... J.L. Nelson, my great-grandfather, put it to Rudolf Steiner. He said, uh, we are no longer at war in the physical world, that if we wish to change the world, we change ourselves, and so the world changes with us, one step at a time. And that's how it's going to work. And how to change the movie, literal uh, experience of what's going on in the physical world, um, is what I'm most interested in now. Basically, in metaphor, the physical world is where we go to be sick, spiritually. And that at some point, uh, we have somehow, and this is in metaphor, given up our memory for some kind of experience as an alien. We're here you know, from some other universe. And we're here for the moment to experience something. And we've given up our memory, this is all in metaphor, in a way for discovery. And at some point, you are able to pathologize your limits, shortcomings, whatever, and then realize your purpose, why you're here. And what Aleister Crowley called that was your magical memory. That's where you pick up from where you left off in a previous life, if you choose to look at time as a, a linear. But um, actually, there's something else going on, and that comes later in you know, self-realization aspects, and that would be what I'm talking about with the non-local mind. Basically, the brain can be seen as a giant crystal, morphous semiconductor, liquid crystals, and so it is, from that definition, a four-dimensional hologram of five space. And that solution suggests that you can go to different places in the brain, which is the purpose of meditation and training the mind, and change reality. I'll tell you what, I believe we, we have the ability to change reality. We just don't know how to fine-tune our... Well, you know, the way this one movie put it, you know, it shows, uh, it's like we're in zombie land. It's, you know, purgatory. Everybody's whining and, and moaning. And uh, we see it as pleasure and sex and joy and greed and all of that. But, in fact... Everything is dark and muddy, and uh, we're all groaning and moaning. And once you wake up uh, and see that aspect of life, 
then you realize that every single one of us has got a extremely important, unique purpose that fits in the whole of things, and that every single one of us is going to have to stand and deliver. And at some point, even getting off your couch potato and having to go swim at the Y, uh, you may not do it this lifetime. No, no problem. We'll do like Dorito corn chips. We'll give you more lives until you get it right. And in other words, time in that kind construct is not real. And really, uh, this is uh, the experience we have of physical pain is the fever <laughs> that we experience in the hallucination of being sick. <laughs> A metaphor. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I find it very interesting. Yeah, well, it's interesting right up to the point of Fukushima and chemtrails. <laughs> yeah, and then, it, and then it all gets real serious again, and we're right back into the soup. So, you know, that idea that man does not actually have rights, he has responsibilities. And uh, if you want to be free, you, know, you think they're going to let you have that? <laughs> uh, you, know, you have a responsibility to be free. Right. Just like in electronic stalking and some of those mentats like alien abductions, you, a man has a responsibility for the thoughts he chooses to entertain. And, and uh, that's your free will thing. And what made us God's favored, you know, over angels and demons and all the rest of it, was that we have this gene in us, homo sapiens sapiens, that is a cooperative gene, and it's got all kinds of things in it. It's got alien genes in it. It's got, you know, like Nephilim. It's got uh, all kinds of uh, Homo Neanderthal. It uh, has integrated all of these different things, which is uh, quite unusual and makes man kind of interesting in that he absorbs and becomes more with the diversity available. There's different kinds of plants in the plant kingdom, you know, like uh, catnip, the pita, the telon, uh, and uh, the catnip is, uh, it, it, it has a single genus and species. It doesn't have any variations or subspecies or variations of species like thyme might. Thyme, English thyme, has like 400 different kinds of variations of the plant. Oregano and marjoram, they all talk back and forth and mutate and so on, whereas dandelion, uh, taxis, uh species, doesn't have a variation. And so um, that's what makes man interesting, is his ability to adapt and cooperate, the genes cooperate. Interesting concept. That's called epigenetics, and that leads to what now I'm writing about, with Monsanto weaponizing our uh, our foods. They're uh, actually attacking us in our enteric nervous system. I wrote a paper with Nexus Magazine uh, last month called uh, The New Directions of Mind Control. I'll upload that for you if you'd like. Is, is that, you'd like that on your site? I can upload that paper for you. People, people can read it. Uh, my talk in Australia last month, this last month, is how to defend yourself. And basically, it is the eight protocols I developed for Navy SEALs to make a super. Now, you were down there with Douglas Dietrich in there, right? Yeah, I got to meet we, Douglas. You we were part of the same group. And uh, was it uh, Mike Oldfield? And, uh, no, that was Tubular Bell, sorry. The other Oldfield. And, uh, you know, some others that were there, yeah. Now, uh, these uh, protocols that you developed for the... Did you develop them for the Navy, or...? Yes, they were, they were specific. The first protocol was essentially, the first book I wrote with Nick Begich was called ESP Induction Through Forms of Self-Hypnosis, How to Think with Your Gut. It was the first protocol for Navy SEALs that when they came to a fork in the road, they wanted to have a protocol where their decision-making, critical decision-making, power tools, uh, was like 400 times over logic or statistical inference. How do you do that? Well, we call that ESP, but really it's part of the gut in the lower brain and it's too up to space time. It's quite unique in that regard and I find it very interesting. 
the higher brain that most people associate with the mind is primarily there to make everything you believe true. <laughs> well, see, now you, you said that, and I work off my gut feeling. Yeah, gut. That's right. Your stomach. You know, I mean, gut. that's what I work off of. If it that is your intuition. Now, that, interestingly, doesn't have statistical inference. See, the logic brain, you know, can come up with a bunch of scenarios. You know, like, in, if I go this way, I'm going to get shot. And if I go that way, I'm going to get hacked. And, you know, it comes up with... Over logic. Points. Yeah, logic. And what happens when you have logic is the way Merlin put it to T.H. White, he said, anything not specifically forbidden is mandatory. So your internal landscape automatically creates thinking with the mind will automatically, the upper brain, will cause that reality, the good, the bad, and the evil, and ugly. And that's how it works. And But your gut, now that's connected to something outside of space and time, intuitions, and that has to do with your purpose here. And the way Crowley used to put it, if you're doing your true will, none will say nay. It's like the entire universe, good, bad, and ugly, want you to do that. And so that's how you determine what you're supposed to do is what happens easy and flows as opposed to you're going to do it kicking and screaming. <laughs> that's where you create karma and those kinds of things. The idea is that you are trying to discover your purpose here, and each of us is different. And it turns out there's no one of us more important than another. It's every single person. I This one guy that spoke at, at Nexus Conference, he had been near-death experiences, white light, tunnel, you know, that, that story. And, and he said that it was the way you greet another human being is that that human being is you in a different life. That every person you meet, this is in metaphor now, every person you meet, you're going to have to experience their reality. And so you treat each person that you meet with that kind of honor and respect. And good luck with that. Because that is where we leave the physical world and ascend to higher levels of consciousness. You know, we'll talk about holographic universe if you'd like, to be distinguished from a quantum one. Uh, in a holographic universe, we speak about information and the resolution of the information. Okay. Physical, emotional, intellectual, archetypal, so on. That's why the Power Tools book is oriented to those eight memes or what I call Timothy Leary's neurologic circuits. It's those geometries, you know, like dimethyltryptamine and so on, is basically uh, a molecule that is the way that forms of information fold down into or out of themselves. And there are eight different neurotransmitters. Have you ever met Timothy O'Leary? Yeah, I studied with him, yeah. You did? You did? Wow. I met him in 1964, and uh, when LSD was still legal, Harvard had gone through a big study to find out what would happen if they gave LSD to a gene genius. They did a big study. Uh, Jack Sarfati was someone on the list. I was on the list. Uh, another one, uh, J uh, Richard Satinover, some others. These are in history. And I was the one selected up in Seattle, the whiz kid in Seattle. And Larry, I was 20 years old. I was at Washington State University, and I never heard of LSD. And Larry came out, talked to my mother, and came out to Pullman and talked to my professor. And that's when I first met Timothy Leary. He was my guide. And I took my first major hit of LSD in 1964. Bill Osley made it. I can tell you about the trip. It was unbelievable. That's probably a catharsis in my life. <laughs> well, oh, you know, uh, I, the reason I laugh is because I've, I've done it. Uh, yeah, on one occasion, I, I, and I'm an old, older guy. I'm 63, and this has been, I'm 69, you know, imagine. You know, so, I, you know. <laughs> Right, right around the same time, I was doing the same thing. Yeah, so. it was in 65 that LSD became illegal. 
and that was that little toad. What was his name? Andrew Will. Yeah, there you go. He's the one that got the toad. And uh, Andrew Will is not what he seems. <laughs> and uh, Timothy Leary, at the time I met him, was a genius. Uh, Tana Wilson, uh, Robert Anton, that got the writ of Hebe's Corpus down in Vacaville that got him released because they had moved him illegally to Chicago. Uh, I can give you the story on that. That was, <laughs> but he wasn't when I saw him then. When he came out of prison, he was not the same person. They had done something to him. His <sighs> vita, elixir vita, that that juice, the 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 spark that you see in me or hear in me, or sense in me. <laughs> that was gone. They cor it was like being cored or something. He wasn't quite the same person. He went on lecture tour and so on, but. Yeah. Quite the same person I, he was in the early I had met uh, Paul Davis, who had done a documentary. Oh, and, yeah. I've heard of Paul. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it was a pretty good interview. We talked about him. Uh, what What other... You're, you're also into uh, botany. <laughs> is, well, that, is that the right word? Medical botany, yeah. I, I've written textbooks on the chemistry of herbs, uh, right. even before... Uh, USDA, I, I, like early years. That was the Legal Highs and Arcus Cookbook. Some of the early stuff I wrote uh, dealt with the chemistry of herbs. The, it, at the time I was writing them, nobody was interested in that. Now, I wrote this one book called The Magical and Ritual Use of Herbs. It was inner traditions. And that kept, because I had signed rituals to the herbs, kept 28 of the herbs out of the Uniform Controlled Substance Act of uh, 1972, and really, it, it, it actually worked. That's why cola nut, and beetle, beetle nut, and, you know, yohimbe, and, uh, what is it, morning glory seeds, and baby Hawaiian weed rose, those are all legal, because they're native plants. Um, there's an interesting story I can give you on insight on, on, on these kinds of drug plants. Um, there's, you know, some of the early brujos, not this crap that's going on now with ayahuasca, but the early years during the custom the early 70s, there were some brujos out of the Brazil that used to suggest that some plants weren't even for men. I find it extremely interesting that a very exotic neurotransmitter called uh, N-dimethyltryptamine is found in the most commonest of plants, Polaris crabgrass. And that it's almost as if it's no longer about chemistry, but a delivery system from God. Well, I, I've heard of this, I've heard of both them drugs, and uh, I've talked to people who have done both of them, and they say it is very spiritual awakening. What, dimethyltryptamine? That's the, uh, uh, it, it's the chill that you have going up and down your spine there, you felt it right then. You, you feel it all the time. That is DMT, very small quantity, mean release. What basically is happening is that you have uh, an electromagnetic uh, wave that goes up and down the spine. You can feel it. It's a little chill. It goes a little chill up the, up the spine. They call that kundalini. But really what it is is a bunch of little philia. They're sitting out there, and they set up a resonant cavity where they got a little uh, electromagnetic beam going up your spine. And it turns out that that electromagnetic radiation beam is in the visible light region. And isn't that interesting? You're talking about the light. And what, if you get your spine just right, you can have that light hit your pineal gland, which is an atrophied part of your glands. Uh, originally, I think the pineal gland was for regulating the body to seasonal changes. And with our artificial lighting and everything, that thing atrophied. But you can stimulate that what I did with a guy named Robert O. Becker, another Nobel Prize winner, he and I wrote a paper on how to regenerate nerve tissue using a beam of light going up. What it does, if you can stimulate the pineal gland, you set up a resonant cavity oscillation in the neural cavity where the other side is the thalamus. And instead, if you have the right diet, you uh, like blue-green algae from Klamath Lake, for example, you have trace minerals across the blood-brain barrier then that the neural cavity can actually make true nerve tissue rather than glial cells. And uh, that's one way to regenerate nerve tissue is working with Kundalini. That was one of the protocols I developed for Navy SEALs.
It's in one of the workbooks. Not one of the ones that's unpublished yet. But how to use the biological function of the third eye, how to regenerate nerve tissue. I had a severed perineal. It took me four and a half months moving true nerve tissue down the central nervous system through gravity. And uh, it took about four and a half months because it's real viscous. And, uh, but you do the visualization exercises, and I have 100% regeneration. I've now got artificial knees and that kind of thing, but I, all my nerve tissues are all intact. No problem. You can do that. Hmm. I find that interesting. I've, I've yeah, got these slip discs in, in my neck. Yeah, and... That's what I did. I was trying to make uh, top-end plebes into supermen. And, right. uh, you know, using like juice, you know, I seem to have a lot of energy. Where did that come from? We call it Soma. And uh, Soma has to do with, uh, in workbook one, I talk about tantric lunar resonance meditation, where there are certain geometries that you envision in your mind's eye based on pre-Vedic systems of math. And uh, what it does is it infuses the body with more Soma. So, of course, the Navy SEALs tried that form of meditation. Guess what? <laughs> Yeah, the rest is history. Yeah. Yeah. You started super soldiers. <laughs> there you go. I have a cut, or what is that called, a backstory to tell you that what do you think our, uh, we think about SEAL Unit 6 and what the corporations are doing to our military. You know, uh, I have some hard feelings about all of that, you know, because it's a God and country, and here we are, uh, you know, to do bidding and dirty ops, and then the assassinated because of what we know. How do you think we feel about that? Oh, I'm, I'm sure it is enough. Well, imagine what's going to happen next. Just fair warning. And there it is. Because I, I, I fully agree with you on that. that we well, have no clue. You never left anybody behind. You don't do that to a Navy SEAL. <laughs> you know, just because he knows something, you don't take him out. That's wrong. Yeah, I so, totally agree with that. Someone needed to say that. There, I did it. I just said it. And so, uh, it, when Eisenhower said, beware of the military complex, uh, what he was actually really referring to are the corporations now that run everything. They yeah. pretty much run everything, don't they? <laughs> yeah, 1%, like the Borg. Resistance is futile. What Monsanto is doing now is not even about GMOs. They are weaponizing epigenetics. There is a bacteria in your gut, you got it, yeah. we, you know, it, got, it came from a cat, it's normally inert, it's called T. gundi, and I affectionately call it little mind benders, and they are modifying a gene in wheat to activate that bacteria so that it goes across the blood-brain barrier and takes over. And imagine what happens next. You turn into a Walmart shopper. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, shopper, I have a big picture of a Walmart shopper, and I have a little question under it saying, wonder what she looked like before Walmart. Which which is on your website, by the way, which is oh, well, richardmiller.com. Yeah, the, where everybody wants to go right now would be oak-publishing.com. That will give you all my titles, um, and that's where you can buy books. That's my, my website. Uh, it, my webmaster died two months ago, and we haven't got a replacement, so... It is uh, very big, very large, very interesting, and but it's not current, and will be shortly, just like Facebook. And that website is my name, richardallenmiller.com. Allen is A-L-A-N. Yeah, it's, Alan it's pretty extensive. I've been on it most of yeah, the time. Yeah, no, I know, I know. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, no, it's good. I, I, it's, yeah, it's, I, tried to, I tried to be a man for all seasons, but, uh, you know... I have certain areas of expertise. Basically, in the early 70s, um, we knew about aliens, but we were more worried about the Russians. That's exactly the truth of it. And so while we, the romance of alien technology and reverse engineering and all of that, I, you know, I don't have a lot of background. I've looked at two artifacts. I've been to Area 51. I have met Krill. You know, I've had some experiences. I don't know what to make of all of that. You know, Krell could have just as easily been from Middle Earth, a uh, humanoid that escaped the flood and went down into the lower regions. We can talk about the Nazi base in Antarctica 
and where the Germans escaped and went down lower after they dropped that nuclear weapon. But really, uh, you know, uh, I think the reason we're not speaking German today is that they ran into something already down there. <laughs> yeah. uh, that might be true. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm sort of leaning towards the hollow earth theory. Oh, well, I don't know about that. Or what large do, caverns of some kind. Down. Yeah, what I do know is there are marmen that swim with dolphin. It's a new humanoid, and it's made the news and uh, the Navy publications. Uh, they're now officially acknowledging there is a humanoid-like uh, amphibious uh, entity that's half human that uh, swims with dolphin. The dolphin have been protecting it from radar by covering them in their pods so we can't notice them. And we've only just noticed a few of dead bodies that washed up. Uh, there's a, what is it, on the Animal Channel, they did a, a thing on it. Kind of interesting. Right. I think there's going to be a lot more surprises like that. For yeah, I've, I've seen a couple of videos that kind of impressed me about the mermaids, but I've seen a yeah. couple that were definitely fakes, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, when I was uh, 12 years old in Seattle, down on the ferries, down on uh, Alaskan Way, there was this uh, cur ye old curiosity shop in Seattle. And they had uh, uh, some artifacts in there that were from the 1800s. There were mermaids that had been discovered. And they look just like the ones that they're showing right now. Uh, they were, no oh, six feet long, probably 100, uh, maybe 80 to 120 pounds, uh, six feet long, 120 pounds, small, thin, humanoid, uh, teeth, looked like something out of Aquaman. <laughs> there you go. Comics rule. <laughs> You know, I I, uh, I don't know what to make of all of it, other than it's all interesting. Here I'm talking on mute. <laughs> Comics educated a whole generation, didn't it? Yes, it did. And look at what it's doing now with Iron Man and all of it. It's just lovely. <laughs> Actually, Johnny Depp's new movie looks like it'll be really good. What is that called? Uh, Ascension. <laughs> uh, I haven't... I haven't heard of that one yet. Oh, check it out. Johnny Depp, Ascension. It's about a supercomputer and he goes into it. Kind of like Free Jack, only different. 20 years later. Well, I believe we're being mechanized for some reason, or kind of mechanized. Well, that's William Gibson. You know, the idea of mechanized. What is that comic book that they haven't done yet? Deathlock. That was a really good comic. What was yeah, it? Locked in between death and life. He's a half machine. Mm. Yeah, cyborg, cyborg. Yeah, I like a cyborg. See, I think that's basically what we we are cre we got things like the internet, and, and uh, I I believe this is kind of our attempt to get back to uh, a world consciousness that we once had in the past. You mean like the Ant Men and the Star Child, little Ant Men from the Hopis, where they had uh, what is it, dendrite in the bone stitches? so that you could tap each other's forehead instead of using pheromone, have data transfer. Hmm. Something like that? Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. You know, I, I think we've changed our nature when we started well, changing nature. Well, uh, <laughs> I wrote a paper. It's on, um, it's on uh, one of my websites called Alien Presence on the Internet. It's about the SETI program, C-E-T-I, the NASA program that uh, would calculate planetary uh, bodies, in other star systems using supercomputer algorithms when vacant computers were available in a networking format on, at any given university. And what happened next was that 360 universities networked up and all of a sudden you had a, an awareness. And they did a big article in Time Magazine about it uh, about almost 20 years ago where we noted that in the Boolean strings when we would ask before when we search engines uh, would come up with different responses to different people. And that's impossible. And that's when we started to realize there was something more going on on the Internet. And then when uh, Cliff High did his, what, Infobots and, and stuff like that where you could do prediction, imagine that consciousness then having babies and giving babies to, what is, oh, I don't know, let's call it Wayback Machine or something like that. <laughs> Little mutations of new life forms springing up all over do, do you see this in our future? It already is happening. Hmm. That's me as a physicist, the Richard Allen Miller saying it. 
It's already happening. Absolutely. See, I find that scary. Well, it's a brave new world. It's, it's yes, fear is the first enemy of man. And then, uh, of course, you can be the 1%, and then you have power. And uh, then, of course, you can become enlightened and have clarity. That's the third enemy. And, of course, I'm facing the fourth enemy right now, which is old age. <laughs> Too old to do anything about it. <laughs> I know that feeling, believe me. Yeah, never ending. How did they put it? Talking heads, same as it ever was. Is this my house burning down? <laughs> <laughs> In our chat room, Lady Aquifa asked, could you ask Dr. Miller a little more about crawl? About what? Crawl. K-R-I-L-L. Krill. Krill. Yeah. Well, when Harry Truman was confronted with a bunch of dead aliens and a dying alien, when the dying alien died, a fourth alien appeared uh, and wanted the bodies. Why? Apparently, they could resurrect them. And they had a, a immortality thing for, you know, fourth space. And so Krill was uh, put... Uh, uh, level eight at Broom Lake, that's eight floors down. And uh, what I met, that's why I wrote my paper on synthetic telepathy. I couldn't understand how she could be communicating to me. Oh, yes. She, it was like a, they were sexless, but I had the impression it was feminine. And I have no memory of what dialogue between us other than I remember first seeing her in my impression. This was a large gray probably seven and a half, maybe eight feet tall, with a very long neck. And uh, I felt no fear. I felt love and feminine. And then I have no memory of whatever happened afterwards other than I've turned into the monster I am. Ha, ha, ha. So I have no idea what Krill is, whether Krill was from another planet, hollow earth, humanoid, Similar, looked human, uh, humanoid, you know, not like us. What, what was the purpose of meeting them? That's a good question. That was one of the reasons. I, she called for me. I was working out of Seattle, Room Lake, of course, is in Utah, or I mean in uh, uh, Colorado. I don't know. Forget where it was. Room Lake. Uh, it was, uh, I had, that was why I got to go there. I had no idea why she called for me other than I was doing paranormal work at the UW, and uh, she wanted to uh, meet me, I guess. And so they arranged to have me brought there, uh, and candidly, I was given one hour of prep, top secret documents, and then the door opened, and I remember encountering her, encountering her, and have no memory afterwards of that. I don't really, you know, it's like a dream. Uh, how she did that, that's what led me to do my work with Alan Frey on, you know, microwave, 0.3 to 3 gigahertz. That's, and, and I was, we were just staring at each other. They have film on it. And they did, like, several weeks of debriefing on me. I went through hypnosis and everything trying to figure out. What even, even though you didn't know anything? I didn't know anything. Uh -uh. Well, see, I'm fine. That well, I don't know what the purpose is. You know, it's like God's purpose. Who knows? Right. You know, you know, I don't know. And and I and, and I'm just what I am. I'm just another guy here in fourth space, fourth grade. That's pretty accurate. And while I might seem very bright, uh, you know, some people can run across the playground faster. We're all still in fourth grade, however. And uh that's truthfully a metaphor. I have no illusions that I'm not special. Right. Yeah, no, I have no illusions on that. I already know that I'm not. I have a sense of my purpose, and it's a really important one, but then... So well, here. well that's, that's what I was kind of getting at. Do you, do you know where, what your, what the intention was in the end? Of, of so, no, I don't see, know. I... See, that's what I'm what? in search of. What's that? I, what I'm supposed to be here for. You well, know? you're probably here to interview me. Who knows? Well, no, know. I'm talking about in the world, you know, in general. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's I think I've planned this yeah. for you. I'm sorry? Do you think this was planned for you? To be, uh, be who you are and doing what you're doing? 
Well, somebody put something together, whether I did it before I chose to give up my memory and I'm now in discovery or, you know, something else is going on. I don't know. I don't know. I have ideas. I have theories. That seems to change every day, every couple of weeks. <laughs> I get a new data point and then all of a sudden the whole thing. <laughs> well, well, that's what science is about or supposed to be about, isn't it? Well, discovery. Good luck. Yeah, yep. yeah. Constant change. Yeah. And nothing's real. You can't assume anything, and trying to isolate the variables, good luck. I mean, you know, it's it, with a field that you're playing in, we're talking about concepts that if you don't even conceive the concept, how can you grasp the, I mean, there's no way to assimilate it, you know, the experience. So there's something else going on, I, I, and I have no, no, um, I have no question about that part. What it is, I have no clue. Uh, you know, I can guess, but I obviously it's about food chain. <laughs> That's kind of weird. You know, I know. Well, the dolphin are very educated, and right. yet porpoise, not porpoise, uh, the, the orca, hunt them. <laughs> so it's food chain. You know, it's like hierarchy of, you know, intent, food chain. I don't know what our purpose is, but it is. We don't have rights. That part I do know. If we had rights, rights would mean full disclosure. And we don't have full disclosure. So what we have is non-full disclosure. That means we don't know what all is going on, which means we can't make the right decisions, which means now what we can do is true will, not free will. And true will is what Crowley talked about, Thelema or Telema, the fourth word for love, your love of purpose the thing that drives you. That is what we do have, that spark. And each of us is different. Right. That's what it's about, trying to find that center. See, I believe we're each different, but part of a whole. Well, and, and this one guy that I encountered, he's a really good speaker at Nexus. I've got his name somewhere. He uh, suggested that what it is is, you experiencing everybody else's life before you get out of here. Well, I, I know that uh, in, in uh, uh, your book there are power tools for the 21st century. I think I had that title right. <laughs> <laughs> I mess up titles. I love stuff. it. And you probably are quite mad, huh? Oh, well. <laughs> It, it's insane, man. So, yeah, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> uh, you you talk about uh, how to test for ESP. I th I think a lot of people don't understand uh, how they are. That they could check and see if they are or not. You know. Well, okay. There are te I have basic tests. You know, standard card tests where you flip a coin. You know, heads or tails. And if you start to get over fifty percent like 70, 80 percent, you're exhibiting paranormal phenomena. Now, if you start exhibiting three sigma, that's 99.99975 percent accuracy, what's that? Pretty darn good. <laughs> well, it's something to do with your soul and your purpose and intent. And it has to do with something that transcends space-time. It's not about space-time. It's like you're... James Hillman wrote about that. He called it the soul's code in search of character and calling. And so each of us have the way we're going to deal with something, a little nooks and crannies, your character. You know, I need a little more cheese with my wine, please. Uh, you know, that kind of humor. Each of us approaches things slightly different based on our character and our calling is the purpose and that part apparently is timeless that means from the moment that you reincarnated and came back and did it again and did it again and did it again uh, is to pick up from where you left off last and that in path working in magic is called magical memory and people have that 
you know, oh, I was Cleopatra when I was, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, uh, that part is epigenetics, you know, that on your DNA, you have a little gene there, and, and that gene knows where it came from. It knows it came from mom, not dad. And the fact it came from mom means that these are certain kinds of things that will happen with that gene as opposed to if it came from dad, it behaves that way. So there is a super code on the DNA that we have not yet described that is now forming the new concepts and field of epigenetics, this, the coding within the code. And that is a holographic system where you talk about information and the resolution of information. And in a holographic universe, then, emotional plane simply the physical plane with more detail. I find that real interesting. Uh, now, we know that everything's made up of space, even down to the smallest level. Well, now, okay, let's take an example. Last year's Nobel Prize was on the physics, was on the Bose Einstein condensate, where they, yes, in sir. space, have these two particles at opposite ends of the universe and somehow are somehow simply connected. That space and time aren't real. And that somehow the, and this particle over here goes up and down like that, and this one over here goes down like that, and they're somehow simply related. That's in a quantum universe. Now, in a holographic universe, that would be the same particle with two different cameras or resolutions on that particle. And so you're looking at uh, the screensaver where the fish is swimming by and the fish is swimming out. And it's basically the same fish, basically with two cameras on it. And that would be a holographic system, which does not deal in space-time. It deals in information and resolution of information. When you deal with space-time in a quantum universe, you have entanglement and decoherence, which would suggest the more you know about one thing, the less you know about something else. <laughs> That's not the way it works. <laughs> that is the way it works, isn't it? Uh, well, maybe. Uh, Heisenberg, you know, had this idea, you know, that, uh, you know, there was the mini-body problem where, you know, was, was it a wave or was it a particle? Well, it's really neither in a holographic system. It is a waveform in a hologram. And a hologram is basically n dimensions of information in n minus one dimensions. It's the way information folds into or out of itself. And that is the whole principle of Hans algebra, you know, with Cliff High and uh, Ben Gertzel and some of those others that are doing the math part. They're using a system of uh, Clifford algebra, it's called Ons algebra, and basically the theorem goes, if you have enough information to ask a coherent question, you have enough information to answer it. I find that intriguing. Well, it's the way you ask the question. Right. And so that structures the reality. Uh, you, you mentioned Cliff High. What do you think of his WebBot uh, deal? Well... Uh, you mean, does it work? <laughs> well, uh, mathematically, there's got to be something there. Well, that's what I'm talking about, algorithms. Yeah. yeah. When you talk about algorithms, though, I'm led to think about, you know, mycorrhizae in the soil and the way soil organisms discuss with viruses and mycelium and they form this aggregate that makes a habitat like Chicago being different than New York City. They call that cybernetic anthropology. And the people you want to read on that one would be Laughlin, the Aquile, and McManus. And this system talks about that if you have the ghetto over here, you know, your viruses over here, mycelium over there, I would suggest that Gaia is a quantum computation algorithm of the Earth. And uh, that there's more going on here than we even have a clue. Oh, I, I believe that now. <laughs> I think we only got about 1% of the foothold on knowledge, personally. Well, knowledge is illusion, according to Castaneda and Yagual. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I, I'm just a bitch that way, aren't I? I, you know, the Nagual is the unspeakable. Reality is that which cannot be known. Once you have these definitions of assumed truths and uh, systems of uh, definitions, then you build your, your, your axioms and theorems and uh, laws and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then you have solutions. And why I've chosen to work with a holographic system over a quantum one for consciousness is that a holographic one allows me to change the movie. Right. That. I, I think, like I said earlier, I think we we can change it. It's it's a collective type. Well, yeah, that's our types, and and uh, you know the collective unconscious and the the numinous. That yeah, that's Carl. Yeah, you bet. Right. That's what we're talking about. Uh, and, uh, modern myths, you know. With uh, uh, personally, I fully believe that the Earth has had civilizations that's made it to this point that we are now in a in a decisive curve either we're going to destroy ourselves or we're going to be like the, the asteroid right way. <laughs> yeah, there you go there's an example yeah, like that could right. have, uh, we can get even weirder how about that vehicle between mercury and the sun that nasa is showing uh, Every, that one i hadn't seen oh it's on nasa's site when it, coronal mass went by mercury it decloaked it and guess what it's moving <laughs> it actually looked like it went right into the sun nasa has pictures I'm going to have to check that out. Yeah, and then there's, i got a better website for you. How about suspiciousobservers.com? You know, oh, he, yeah, I check him out once in a while. <laughs> I've, I've <laughs> spoken with him before. He's been on the Yeah, screen. he's pretty knowledgeable. I, I like his stuff, and I use that in terms of my physics. His astrophysics is useful. <laughs> I'm, uh, but there's not going to be very many people like me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, well, I'm a little bit different. How did the Joker put it to Batman? Yeah, wait till they get all over to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you're, you're, you you do good. Uh, what I've read and uh, when I've talked to you, yeah, uh, you you got your head on your shoulders. You know what's going on, and you're down to earth. Yeah, but my boss is the Red Queen from the uh, you know what is that Armageddon movie? <laughs> the Red Queen. It's a computer simulation. <laughs> That's my boss. Uh, off with his head. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's all good. I'm the Wizard of Oz. In fact, that's a place for you to take. Do a Google called I Married the Wizard of Oz. Watch what comes up. <laughs> my my ex-wife is CIA. She wrote about what she saw me do in the military. What was, <laughs> was that the one I co-authored the book with you? Yeah, I've co-authored a couple of things with Iona. Yeah, she's a diva, definitely. I affectionately call her the icicle of Isis. <laughs> <laughs> I love that wife. She, she and I were married 18 years, and the last 27, we've been best friends. Every once in a while, I have to play a little close to my chest because she is CIA. She writes all their spin, and uh, I'm Navy Intel. I'm Luke Sky Guy. And uh, so, you know, sometimes there's a little conflict of interest. But what, she's a diva. Would right you, now, she's hanging out with uh, the Brotherhood of Eternal Love. Ah! Oh. <laughs> Wait, what?